Today's webinar presentation is titled Ticks, Mice, and Japanese Barberry. Our presenter is Tom Wordley with the Associate Extension Professor at University of Connecticut. Tom's educational and outreach activities focus on forest stewardship and forest management planning on private lands. He teaches undergraduate dendrology and forest management classes, as well as helps to facilitate several research projects at the University of Connecticut. Prior to his academic position, he had several years of experience with forest industry, as well as consulting. A small private woodland owner himself, he finds himself dealing with many of the same issues that confront forest landowners all over the region. And so with that, I welcome Tom uh, to the webinar series this morning, and uh, we'll turn it all over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging my colleagues, Dr. Jeffrey Ward and Dr. Scott Williams, who are not with the University of Connecticut. They're actually with the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and um, they were very close uh, partners in all of the research and uh, field trials that we did um, uh, in the course of uh, uh, investigating these particular questions. And Scott Williams continues to uh, do an awful lot of uh, uh, research in the area of uh, ticks and um, uh, other animals uh, associated with them. And uh, you know, if you were to look him up, you'd find an awful lot of uh, uh, research, new research information on that. Um, we, uh, we did get a little snow out of the most recent uh, uh, storm that came up the coast here, but not too much, a couple inches, it's sticky and wet. I imagine it'll be snowing all day in the woods as the as the stuff that's uh, stuck to the trees now uh, melts and, and drops off. But uh, be that as it may, our um, uh, our discussion is for, uh, you know, a couple of weeks from now when things uh, uh, in the Japanese barberry world begin to green up, you'll be able to see uh, the Japanese barberry for uh, uh, for what it is because it uh, it gets green before everything else. But um, uh, in the broader area of invasive species, uh, if you look around a, a typical abandoned field or meadow, you begin to see a variety of different things. Um, uh, this particular picture is uh, winged euonymus or burning bush. Uh, and uh, we have uh, multiflora rose beginning to show up. Um, oriental bittersweet, and the one I consider to be uh, public enemy number one in our part of the world, Japanese barberry. These four, um, let me back up a little bit, you know, the whole world of dealing with invasive species sometimes feel, feels like we're shoveling sand against the tide, but um, uh, if we uh, uh, spend our efforts and focus on a few that we consider to be the worst problems, try to nip them in the bud by uh, uh, we can have a little bit of control over how some of these invade. And um, you know, in the forest settings, the, the four I've mentioned, winged euonymus, oriental bittersweet, uh, Japanese barberry, and um, uh, uh, multiflora rose tend to be the ones that give us the most, uh, uh, are most problematic in the uh, in in forest settings, in forest edges, if you will, at least uh, in in southern New England. Um, I imagine that uh, those sorts of things will begin to show up in northern New England as well. Uh, Japanese barberry, I consider to be the the the, uh, um, the worst problem because of how rampant it is around our landscape. That um, uh, it has uh, all the ideal characteristics to be the perfect landscape planting uh, plant for around your home. It greens up early in the spring. In fact, it turns green before everything else. Um, it has no uh, na native uh, enemies that I'm aware of. Nothing eats it, nothing feeds on it. There's no diseases that affect it that we're aware of. Um, it has the ability to photosynth photosynthesize in very, um, uh, wide range of light conditions from low, you know, 90% canopy coverage up to full sunlight. Um, it has uh, uh, it has the ability to retain its green leaves late into the fall when everything else has gone dormant. And so it has these uh, competitive advantages in the environment. Uh, lots of low hanging fruit that uh, um, is a is of low um, low um, <clears throat> nutritional value to birds and other animals. They will eat it if they're desperate, but uh, it can revegetate by, um, by seed as well as by vegetative processes. Uh, 
this is a, a not a typical situation uh, in southern Connecticut. Uh, this happens to be a, a stand of mixed hardwoods. Uh, there's some black birch uh, ash, red maple in this stand. There's probably a, a perched water table, one of those hard pan soils. Uh, um, and uh, the barberry is just rampant there. Um, uh, th this condition didn't happen overnight. You know, these things uh, start out with one or two bushes and they, they spread. Uh, there, You know, you're looking at a standard Japanese barberry there that's, you know, probably 30 or 40 or 50 years in the making. When we look close, uh, you know, just from a, an identifying characteristics point of view, the barberry has these, uh, these very small kind of teardrop shaped leaves. Uh, the margins are entire and the... Um, uh, uh, the the flowers are are, um, uh, are are small, kind of indistinct. They're they're pinkish when they first open up, um, and they don't last very long. The the, the green berry forms up fairly quickly. Um, the, the 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 leaves kind of form in uh, in uh, little whorls or clusters. Along the uh, stems, we have uh, um, pretty sharp thorns. Um, there is a native um, barberry that uh, does. Uh, I live in the region. I've only seen it maybe three times in the wild in my career. Um, and where you see one thorn uh, at a time on the Japanese barberry stems in the picture, uh, you would see a pattern of three um, uh, at each node um, along the plant if the barberry was native. And there would also be a little bit of a, of a toothed margin on the, on the native barberry leaf. Uh, the, the fruit, when it ripens, turns red, hangs right down there, um, and, um, you know, is used mostly by small animals and birds uh, in the wintertime when they run out of other food sources. The, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the thorns, um, the thorns are also uh, uh, an aggravation if you, they happen to uh, uh, if you happen to come in contact with them, they break off very easily. Uh, they're a very narrow tapered, tapered cylinder. Uh, they get into your flesh. It's hard to get them out. And, um, uh, you know, you, uh, um, you carry them around for a while sometimes. And uh, uh, sometimes you're not even aware that they're there. Uh, if you were to cut the stem, you would see this bright yellow uh, interior to the stem. Uh, sorry, this uh, photograph is a little out of focus, but um, you get the idea that uh, um, if you're, you know, uh, if you're disturbing the vegetation and you see this bright, bright yellow uh, uh, interior uh, of the twig, why, you know, you know you've got the right, uh, the right plant here, or the wrong one, as the case may be. Um, Japanese barberry spreads through um, th seeds that are either eaten by birds uh, from the berries that are eaten by birds. They drop them all over the place or or um, uh, or seeds that simply drop off the plant nearby and, um, uh, you know, start another plant. But um, the plant can also spread uh, vegetatively through layering. And if we look um, fairly uh, closely at uh, the interior of this little box here, you can see where uh, um, one of the branches or what we call ramets of the plant has been, uh, uh, br you know, brought down towards the soil um, in, uh, you know, a, 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 another branch or twig or something uh, has, uh, has landed on it and held it down close to the soil. And another, um, another barberry plant has uh, taken root there. And uh, in this way, the, uh, um, the, the barberry infestations kind of spread like a big tumor across the landscape. And so um, what we're suggesting is you shouldn't let this happen to you. <laughs> so the major reason why we've become concerned with Japanese barberry is we were, we were working on um, uh, invasive species control <clears throat> ideas uh, in general. Uh, we were also experimenting with the use of directed flame as a uh, as a tool as an alternative tool to controlled burning you know uh, it was just one of these I crazy ideas that I had about uh, well if if it's if it's not possible to actually do, actually do controlled burning in a place can you take a propane torch out there and achieve the same effect on selected plants uh, by uh, by using the propane torch and of course uh, you know uh, big boys will be big boys and we torched a a variety of things just to see if they would uh, uh, get killed and uh, barberry being one of them. 
And we found that the torch was actually pretty effective on the barbarian, but in the process of working on the barbary, we um, uh, began to see this problem with ticks. Anytime we were working in barbary stands, uh, we would um, we would come away with a larger number of ticks on our clothing and on our bodies than um, than in other places in the woods. And we said, well, you know, what's going on here? Every time we work in the barbary, I come home, I got 10 ticks on me. And most of the time I might have uh, one, one tick or, or none whatsoever. And so here's the thing. If you get down close to the ground in these barbary uh, plantations, <laughs> plantations, barbary stands, barbary patches, barbary, whatever you want to call them, um, you'll find this this very dense tangle of stems uh, mixed in with the the, the native uh, vegetation and the uh, and the woody uh, material and and leaves on the ground and uh it's a it's a very protected habitat for um, a variety of little critters that uh, uh, make use of these places uh, in particular the the, the white-footed mice and other small rodents that uh, um, can um, uh, run around under these uh under these patches and uh they're protected from predators uh, there's no fox that's going to come charging into that stand of barberry and there's no hawk that's going to come flying down in and so the mice uh, you know multiplied uh, quite dramatically in these areas and uh, um you know are feeling quite protected now these nice cute little mice are um uh also uh become host to these other uh uh, uh, these other critters that are found there, and these are the the black-legged ticks, and the the uh, the ticks are are abundant because they have a a meal source uh, uh, in close proximity uh, uh, at the beginning of their life cycle. So the black-legged tick is the one that carries most of the diseases here, and uh, if you look at the 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 tick at different um, life stages, you'll see that when it's first born, it is uh, very, very small and, um, you know, almost uh, to the point of, uh, um, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to see it with the naked eye. Um, it has to go through a, a change of size, a change of skin, if you will, in order to grow into the next, uh, uh, into the next stage. And it needs a blood meal to do that. When the tick hatches out from an egg and it's very small like that, it does not have tick-borne diseases. It is not born with the diseases that um, are passed along by ticks. The ticks get the diseases in the process of obtaining their first blood meal and turning into a juvenile in their second blood meal as they progress to adult stage. Once the tick has is carrying the, the diseases, it um, it has it the the rest of its life, you know. So if you get bit by a, a tick in a in the later stages of uh, its life cycle, um, it's going to pass diseases on to you. But the ticks get the diseases from the mice. Uh, those are the ones that are carrying the um, the diseases that get passed on to ticks. So, um, and well, not the rodents, but mostly the the white-footed mice and. Uh, uh, here's a here's a close-up look of a little white-footed mouse, and uh, that was captured in order to do a tick count and to do some other uh, um, uh, examination of uh, you know uh, the diseases it was carrying. But uh, just on this one ear alone, there's a dozen um, very small ticks that uh, are getting their first blood meal, and um, you know, every mouse that's in that patch probably has the same condition. And this is just one ear. We're not looking at its neck and we're not looking under its uh, under its uh, legs and, and uh, at its belly or anything like that. So there's literally hundreds of ticks that are um, getting a first blood meal from small rodents and white-footed mice and picking up diseases in the process that they can then pass along. Here's a short list of some of the diseases that are carried by ticks. Um, the most important ones in our part of the world are uh, the two at the top, uh, anaplasmosis and babesiosis. Uh, uh, we see some ehrlichiosis, and then uh, mid midway down the the um, uh, the list is uh, Lyme disease. That's the most common, and um, it's the one that's most commonly carried by the mice and then the ticks. 
and uh, it's uh, it's spreading uh, around the countryside, and um, it's the one that we uh, uh, often find uh, in in places where it's new that uh, the medical community is not familiar with it. It gets misdiagnosed and uh, um, and, and it becomes a, a big issue. Some of these are uh, some of these diseases are viral diseases. Some of them are bacterial diseases. Some of them can be uh, treated with antibiotics if they're diagnosed correctly. Others you just kind of have to wait it out. Just below Lyme disease on the list is a new one called Powassan disease. Now Powassan disease is very rare. There's only been you know, a handful of documented cases, um, but it does have the ability to be deadly within a few hours. And uh, we've often talked about, well, if you get the tick off of you in within 24 hours of it biting you, um, you know, it doesn't have time to pass the Lyme disease spirochete into your bloodstream. But Powassan disease is different. It can pass into your bloodstream within two hours. And for people who have depressed immune systems or who are otherwise ill or a heart disease or, you know, small children and that sort of thing, this disease can be uh, fatal. So it's something to, to be aware of that it's, that it's out there and it, ha and it reacts very, very quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Um, the, uh, the status of, uh, this is a, a kind of a dated map, but uh, it does uh, give a, a, an indication of where we're seeing um, these things uh, uh, take place. Uh, you can imagine it all quite expanded. Japanese barberry is found in um, uh, uh, all 20 northeastern states uh, and several of western states, um, uh, three or four uh, Canadian provinces at this point and uh, some of the southern states, and it's spreading uh, relatively rapidly. Where Barbary is considered aggressively invasive uh, is from Missouri east to North Carolina and north to the state of Maine, and includes the state of Wisconsin. Um, what's very interesting is that the reported Lyme disease cases uh, uh, seem to follow the pattern of uh, Japanese barberry uh, in the country. Um, uh, you know, the first case uh, being in Connecticut, uh, uh, and it's named after the town of Lyme, but, uh, um, you know, uh, it has spread very, uh, um, uh, very uh, aggressively uh, throughout the Northeast, uh, up into uh, uh, northern New England, uh, western into uh, New York, Pennsylvania. And then uh, there's this uh, this uh, smattering of cases in the upper Midwest as well. Uh, so it is showing up uh, all over the country and uh, only, uh, only getting worse as the case may be. So we all hear about deer and we call these black-legged ticks deer ticks. Well, you know, the deer uh, do pass through the woods and they, uh, they are a warm-blooded critter just like anything else. And when that tick is out there questing, um, we, uh, um, find that it can uh, attach itself to a, a deer as much as anything else. And um, this is often at the later life uh, stages of the tick. And so the deer picks up the tick. The tick is getting its final blood meal before it, uh, um, it gets to its uh, mature life stage and reproduces itself. And the deer, of course, uh, travel around quite, quite uh, large distances. And so um, they're the ones that are guilty of spreading the ticks from one place to another and, uh, and often spreading the disease from one place to another uh, where perhaps a tick population was low. Now it's going to be higher. And um, the abundance of deer, at least in, in our landscape in southern New England, uh, is a big contributor to how the how the tick population uh, increases across the landscape and how the disease uh, spreads from place to place. So um, if you want to pause for a minute here, um, I'm going to begin to talk about um, uh, um, the control methods that we've experimented with in order to uh, in order to reduce the, uh, some of these barberry uh, infestations, with the idea that uh, um, you know that by reducing the uh, the the habitat for mice and ticks, that we would reduce the incidence of of, of Lyme disease as well. Um, the uh, 
we, we don't have solid data on actual disease reduction yet, but uh, uh, we do have some, um, uh, some information on, on the populations of, of deer and mice. But if there's any questions to this point, um, I'd be more than happy to try to entertain them. Thanks, Tom. And just a reminder to folks listening in, uh, if you want to go ahead and submit any questions, um, you can find the question box on your side panel in the GoToWebinar uh, side panel. So go ahead and type your questions into that box. Um, and we'll give folks a second to type in some questions. Looks like we have a question here, Tom, from John. Where do ticks overwinter? Uh, over the the ticks over winter in the uh, in the duff layer in the organic material, uh, you know, in the leaves in the um, um, you know near the soil surface. And actually, ticks spend an awful lot of time in that area. Ticks are very uh, sensitive to um, um, uh, humidity changes, and uh, it's uh, it, it seems to be when the humidity is high, either in the morning or late in the day, when the dew point changes, is when they get out on the uh, on the tips of the branches of these uh, uh, of, of these shrubs and uh, exhibit their questing behavior. They're out there waving their uh, waving their antenna and waving their their front legs to uh, uh, try to uh, grab something that might be passing by. And uh, when it dries up during the middle of the day, or if you're in a dry spell late in the summer or something like that, the, the tick uh, population will not be out as abundantly um, doing questing. They will drop off, they'll get down into the soil uh, or down into the duff layer where it's uh, um, where, where, where there's more moisture available so they don't become desiccated. But they do overwinter right there in the, in the ground. Great, thanks Tom. And the next question is around uh, recommended control for Japanese barberry. So I guess that's a transition to the next. Uh, that, that's what we're gonna talk about for the next topic. little while here, okay? Any, any others? That's it, yeah, so. Okay, well. As you can see from the, the slide that I have um, uh, put up next, simply cutting the, the, uh, the Japanese barberry won't control it. Barberry behaves like most of our other hardwoods. If you cut it um, during the early and middle stages of its lifespan, it's going to re-sprout uh, quite prolifically. Um, Japanese barberry is, a, is an unusual kind of woody plant in that the, the the, the stems themselves, the, the, the ramets that we call them, are not really woody as you think of most woody shrubs. They're, they're, um, uh, they're a softer kind of consistency. The real woody part of the plant is right at the soil surface. So there's a, there's a, a, a fist-shaped uh, uh, root and bud, so woody uh, root and wood and a woody root and bud supporting structure um, right at the at the soil surface. You can see where we where we cut one up and, and cut it apart there. We have a picture of it. And um, um, and that's the woody part of the plant. And um, part of it is beneath the, the, the soil surface and part of it is just above the soil surface. And it's just these ramets that uh, that show up at, uh, um, above the above the ground. And uh, if you just cut them off, that woody knob will send out a, a, a whole bunch more um, uh, sprouts and that plant will be back to the um, the original size it was or larger within two growing seasons uh, that we have seen. Let me back up just a little bit. Um, about the, the tick and the mice populations. Um, we found that in, um, in trapping mice that um, the, the mouse populations within Japanese barberry infestations were slightly higher, but not in a statistically significant way than mouse populations in adjacent woodlands that were not infested with Japanese barberry. And so the mice are obviously going back and forth, uh, you know, to take advantage of food sources or whatever it is they do. But uh, we did find that mice carrying ticks were sig significantly higher within those um, Japanese uh, barberry infestations. And uh, in finding ticks themselves and dragging ticks um, 
you know, dragging, uh, using a, a dragging device to try to uh, give a count of ticks uh, in, in these areas. When we looked at the Japanese barberry infestations or we looked at the open woodlands, there were, um, you know, we might find 10 ticks per acre uh, in the open woodlands and we'd find 120 ticks per acre in the, uh, in the Japanese barberry. And so there's a dramatic difference. And uh, the, um, uh, the ticks, many of the ticks were tested for Lyme disease spirochete and uh, the, the differences were, were just as dramatic uh, between ticks found in the open woodlands and ticks found within the Japanese barberry infestations. You know, and, and in Connecticut, there's a number of places where, uh, you know, woodland areas that are, are protected or that are, are parks or that are public woodlands or, you know, where there's trails and they pass through these areas and the you know, on either side of the trail, there's this heavy Japanese barberry infestations and the branches are, um, you know, uh, hanging out over the trails. And, uh, you know, so uh, the fact that there's uh, such a high number of, of ticks in these areas that are carrying the Lyme disease spirochete, uh, you know, becomes a public health issue in, in places where there's, uh, where there's heavy uh, recreational use of the forest. So back to uh, talking about what do we do about it? Well, um, there's a a group of people who feel like uh, you know well let's just pull it out by the roots you know and <laughs> you know God bless them they they like to uh, you know uh, you know put some effort in on a Saturday morning and and yet uh, uh, and it's very effective at killing the plant don't get me wrong but uh, there's only so much you can do in this way and um, uh, you know if you have a healthy group of volunteers that uh, uh, are engage want to engage week after week in backbreaking labor well okay fine but uh, uh, you can't pay somebody to do this uh, and have it be effective. Um, the um, um, the other downside of this is that if you pull a plant out of the soil and um, you don't replace it with something else, then the, you've got a, a patch of bare soil there for <coughs> some other invasive to take advantage of if you're not uh, doing effective control of everything else. And so um, with uh, with garden clubs and, and land trusts and uh, park managers and this sort of thing. I, I counsel people that if they're going to pull Japanese barberry out by the roots, they should have handy uh, a follow-up person right there to replace it with a, a native shrub, uh, uh, you know, a highbush blueberry or, or something like that, that would be appropriate to the site uh, to take advantage of that, uh, that bare soil condition. Um, there are some shrubs you I don't know if anybody's ever worked with one of these uh, weed wrenches uh, they're really effective for um, um, being able to pull things out of the uh, out of the ground um, uh, using uh, mechanical advantage and leverage but uh, doesn't work too well with Japanese barberry because of the multiple uh, um, stem um, uh, con condition that the plant grows in and uh, uh, so uh, while it uh, uh, it's an effective tool for other things. Uh, you know, winged euonymus, for example, um, not doesn't work really great on, on Japanese barberry. Uh, you can try digging it out, but uh, uh, you know Connecticut's not so different from Vermont in that we have any our any number of stones in the soil, and uh, you know this is a a, a, some, a way you can uh, <coughs> use too much leverage on some of your tools. Uh, it's also very expensive to do these kinds of things. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we, we tried some other, um, some other methods to uh, see if we could come up with a, a reasonable expense, uh, effective uh, set of control methods that people could put to work. And um, we tried mechanical uh, treatments, repeated mechanical treatments. We tried herbicide treatments uh, of two different types of herbicides. We, of course, uh, were working with directed flame, as I mentioned, and then we worked with the combinations of the two. And in places where you can put together a team and do prescribed fire and control burning, why well, that was considered as a control method as well. Um, what we're finding is that uh, um, the tools that you use for mechanical treatments for cutting or severing the above ground portion of the plant um, uh, varies from uh, place to place depending on the conditions of the, the surface of the ground. And, uh, you know, in a, 
in a very rocky place, one type of tool is going to work better than another in an abandoned field where you don't have so many rocks that have grown up. Why uh, you might it might be effective to use a uh, a different type of tool. The thing is that um, with mechanical treatments, you need to be repeating the treatment over and over and over again. You uh, get out there um, as soon as the plant breaks bud and starts to grow leaves and cut it off. Um, in order to send out new leaves, of course, the plant is drawing on reserves that are in that uh, in the root system. And um, uh, if you cut it off and it sends up new sprouts, it has drawn on those reserves again. And if you go back and cut it again, it'll send up sprouts again. Um, I'm talking about uh, you know six weeks later or eight weeks later. You go back uh, during the growing season and cut it again. It'll it'll draw on what reserves it has left and um, uh, send up a few more sprouts, but perhaps not as many. And um, uh, if you can get back there and cut it even a third time, why that might be enough to exhaust the plant and eventually kill it. But uh, you need to be real diligent about uh, uh, doing that, uh, that follow-up uh, cutting. If you let it overwinter, finish the growing season, why it's gonna store up more reserves and it'll just be harder to kill the next year. Uh, herbicide works really well, but uh, um, like anything else, it's a it's a calculated risk. It's a lot less expensive to uh, apply some herbicide in a large area, and um, in those vast uh, uh, ten acre infestations, you know, perhaps the uh, uh, the um, the sprays of um, you know the fog sprayers and that kind of thing will work really well, and um, uh, and what we found was important with herbicide was was timing. Um, there's a narrow window of time in the springtime that barberry greens up and nothing else has started yet. And you can, uh, if conditions are just right, you can get out there and do a broadcast foliar spray and not really affect other things like your spring ephemerals or other uh, or other plants that you don't want to kill with your with your herbicide. And there's a window of time in the fall, uh, in the late summer and fall, when a lot of these things have gone dormant. Um, uh, of course, the spring ephemerals are not around anymore. Um, and um, uh, some of your native shrubs have already uh, lost their leaves and gone dormant, but barberry still has some green in it. Uh, you can uh, get some herbicide on it at that time uh, also and uh, avoid um, you know, killing non-target uh, species. The directed flame is an interesting uh, alternative to herbicide for places that where people don't want to use herbicide, um, uh, or they or they have rules against it. Um, there are some places in Connecticut, uh, uh, land trusts and and conservation organizations that don't want to use chemicals. Um, same with some of the um, um, the water company watershed uh, properties, and so. Um, uh, while we don't consider flame to be a the directed flame to be truly organic because we're um, using propane, um, it is non-chemical and it is quite effective. And uh, and uh, uh, we're using a, a very high intensity, uh, narrowly directed heat to the the base of the plant, um, and it um, uh, uh, effectively uh, girdles the, the 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 plant and kills the basal buds. Um, so that, uh, um, uh, you know, the plant uh, it doesn't have the opportunity to re-sprout. But we've, what we've found is that the combination of, uh, of um, a combination of methods seems to be the, uh, the thing that's most effective in, um, in, in getting 90% uh, uh, 90, 90 or more mortality of the barberry uh, infestation itself. So here's a here's a picture of Dr. Ward uh, uh, applying a directed flame to a propane torch. Um, one of the uh, technicians is using a, the brush saw in a in in a in a thicker stand of Japanese barberry. We've gone as far as taking these uh, flail mowers uh, mounted on uh, skid steers out in the woods and run them around to uh, reduce the upper portion of the plants. And that's an awful lot of fun, but it's expensive. And um, uh, and, and tried some other methods as well. Uh, you know, certainly if you have the, uh, the ability to get around with a brush hog and a, uh, and a tractor, um, you know, mowing the upper part of the, the plant uh, as an initial mechanical treatment uh, is effective. In some places we had really good luck with the, uh, the DR mower type of uh, device. Um, 
because this will tackle a pretty sizable plant, uh, but it also chops everything up and uh, doesn't leave a lot of, um, uh, you know, un unbroken part of the upper part of the plant around. With the handheld brush saw, you can sever it, but then the branches are, and all of that are still in your way. And so um, we, we've we've had to send out a team of people where one is operating the brush saw and one is using an iron rake or something like that to to pull the brush out of the way and put it in a pile whereas this device here chops it all up and turns it into chips so the brush saw we're we're recommending is um and this is a this is a good picture of uh, the pl the kind of place where you want to do an initial mechanical treatment uh, with a directed flame follow up or uh, a repeated mechanical treatments uh, where you are in close proximity to running water or you're in a wetlands or something like that. Here, the technician has his full uh, uh, facial and head protection and chaps on, um, is uh, fully clothed to avoid the. Uh, um, the, the, the ticks, the, the, the clothing has been treated with tick repellent. Uh, the only thing that's uh, uh, not quite correct in this photograph is the blade that, that he's using on the, uh, on the brush saw. They tried one of these chainsaw tooth blades. It didn't work very well. You, you waste a lot of time sharpening, especially where you're in rocky terrain. So we found that we, if you use one of these uh, brush knife heads that have um, three or four veins on them. It's very effective for cutting that upper part of the, the barberry plant. And um, uh, it's easy to sharpen if you happen to nick a rock with it or something like that. You just have to carry a flat file around in your back pocket. And uh, so uh, we can cover a lot of ground with these tools and um, uh, to do an initial mechanical treatment to get the upper part of the plant out of the way. Now, the idea here is that we know here, here, here is the technician working in in uh, in March uh, uh, or early April, uh, cutting Japanese barberry, knowing full well that in a couple of weeks it's going to send up new sprouts. But the thing is that um, if you're going to follow up with a, a directed flame or in in another location a, a an herbicide treatment, then you can go back and just treat the sprouts. You're not treating this whole. Uh, large plant that's full of foliage. And so you're going to use a lot less chemical or a lot less propane, as it were. Um, in some places, the uh, the wand style uh, pressure uh, um, uh, herbicide application, uh, uh, you know, for targeting an individual plant uh, is effective. In other places, uh, we talked about the fogging uh, device where uh, uh, you have a large infestation. You go at the right time of year, you can uh, uh, cover a, a, a you know a fairly large area. Um, we we do mix a, a dye into the um, into the herbicide mix so that we know uh, we can look at the plants and see have they been uh, have they been treated with the herbicide or not. Uh, so you don't overuse the chemical or, or you don't uh, miss spots if you can help it. Um, some people ask me about the cut and dab method. Well, you know this is not. Um, uh, this is not a, an ineffective way of treating any unwanted uh, invasive plant. In this case, you're looking at a, uh, a, a, a the stem of a vine of Oriental bittersweet where somebody has cut the vine and then immediately applying some herbicide to the cut stump. And in the second half of the growing season, this is a very effective way to kill off things like this. It's not quite so effective on Japanese barberry because of the, the multiple nature of the, um, of the, um, uh, the, the, the no, numerous stems that come out of that, uh, that, uh, that woody, uh, you know, root ball, if you will. And um, um, what we found instead is if that, if we want to cut off the top of the plant and then treat with herbicide, um, it's better to do it with one of those uh, uh, pressure um, backpack uh, sprayers, a, a, a solo backpack sprayer or something like that, where you can just get a little bit of herbicide right on that cut uh, stump area uh, and treat all the little stems at the same time. It's very directed. You don't use very much chemical and you and it's pretty low risk for, um, you know, uh, causing uh, uh, herbicide to get on a non-target individual plant. So um, 
Uh, so the modification to cut and dab is cut and squirt in this case. So, um, and, and that will work. We found that it works best uh, in the second half of the growing season. It just has to do with the, the, the natural flow of the plants themselves. Early in the growing season, the, you know, the, 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 the plant is sending uh, uh, the, the nutrients and, and materials it needs to send out leaves and send out and break buds and, and make fruit and so forth and so on. Later in the growing season, the, the photosynthetic synthetic activity of the plant is, is more in uh, producing uh, um, carbohydrates that are gonna be put in the storage. So, you know, the, the flow within the plant is kind of down towards the roots. And if you do this, uh, this uh, mechanical treatment with a follow-up squirt on herbicide, uh, in the second half of the growing season, you know, the flow of the, the natural flow of the plant is sort of down into the roots. And so it's going to draw that herbicide down into the roots and kill it off pretty well. Uh, you know, if you really want to be uh, uh, targeted, there are tools out there to use. Um, here's the here's the solo backpack sprayer once again with the, uh, the vegetable dye. Uh, we found that um, the same applies with the, uh, the, uh, the, propane torch. If you have a scattered infestation of barberry where you can reach an individual plant and you can go with a torch and flame it for 10 seconds on one side and then walk around the plant and flame it for 10 seconds on the other side, you're going to get, uh, you're, you're going to kill that plant pretty well and you're going to prevent it from being able to re-sprout. Uh, right in the immediate vicinity of the, um, um, uh, of the, of the root area of the of the Japanese barberry plant plant you you're um you're kind of sterilizing the soil a little bit um at least the upper parts of it um but uh you are killing those basal buds and that's the whole idea um we tried 100,000 BTU uh torch and a 400,000 BTU torch it comes uh from the factory with a backpack and a uh, the nozzle and the little uh, canister for propane, and um, uh, it's uh, uh, the the weed dragon is made by a not that I'm advocating for this one, but the one we used is uh, is made by a company called Flame Engineering. They're in Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, to give you a little uh, reference, the um, uh, the Typical backyard gas grill is 20,000 BTUs. So 400,000 BTUs, that's an awful lot of heat that is uh, directed to one spot. Um, the hottest part of the flame is about eight inches to a foot away from the tip of the wand. And, uh, you know, you stand back and you just... Uh, press on the lever, there's a there's a lever, um, you can see that Dr. Ward has his thumb on a little uh, uh, lever uh, that opens the valve completely. You can leave it slightly open so it's like a little pilot light. You don't have to light it every time. And uh, you just uh, walk around with the pilot light lit at the at the tip and then when you open the valve it gives it a full shot of propane if you get in too close uh it's not as hot and you also rob oxygen from the flame so you you back off a little bit uh we we found that this is very effective it is time consuming and labor intensive and so more expensive if you will than um uh than follow-up herbicide um but um uh it uh, it still is an effective uh, uh effective at killing the plant. Um, in a larger infestation with the with the flame torch, you want to uh, pursue a, 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 um, a technique much like what we talked about with cutting the top of the plant, letting it re-sprout and, and uh, you know, squirting herbicide on it. On the new sprouts, you can do the same thing with the with the with the torch um, and it's pretty effective. Um, you cut the top of the plant, you wait for it to re-sprout, you come back with the torch and, um, you know, and you hit the sprouts. You got to be careful <laughs> because um, once you've cut the top of that plant off, now you have these piles of brush hanging around and they dry out and you you run the risk of, you know, there's a higher risk of, uh, uh, of having a fire that you don't want. Um, uh, in, in under those conditions, but uh, um, you can kill the plant just as effectively on a damp, foggy, misty day as you can, um, you know, on a dry day. And so uh, we restricted most of this uh, type of activity to times when it was uh, a, a little damp, and um, you know, the 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 uh, 
the soil surface was holding a lot of moisture and uh, so that we're just uh, we're just working on killing the plant and not setting anything else on fire. Um, here's uh, here's the technician trying to um, uh, uh, work around a, a large, uh, a fairly large bush. Uh, that heat will kill uh, portions of the upper part of the plant just as the heat rises. It'll desiccate the leaves and and kill them off. But he's really focused on the on the base of the plant. You can see how far away he's holding the wand from the uh, uh, the the base of the plant and um, hearing protection. Notice the hearing protection. This is loud. This is a this is a roaring flame, and so you want to have uh, hearing protection. The other thing is that uh, we found that there was a fatigue factor uh, associated with this. That uh, um, you know you wanted to take a break every uh, uh, every little while or switch off jobs um, with other uh, technicians as as this went on. Um, you you have to avoid things like poison ivy. Um, uh, you don't want to be cooking poison ivy and breathing the fumes. Um, so there are some uh, um, common sense kind of practical uh, uh, things associated with using flames in the damp woods that uh, um, you want to uh, uh, just be aware of if you try to undertake this kind of thing. We found we didn't need any permits to do this because there was no active fire. Um, What's not in this picture is a person who's standing by with that backpack sprayer with just water in it, you know, and uh, they're dousing any little uh, hot um, sparks that they might see that are still there a, a couple minutes later. So, but usually this uh, this goes right out um, uh, after you're done actually flaming the uh, the plant. So the two-step pre procedure, you start with an initial healthy plant, you kill the above ground tissues uh, in some way, uh, usually mechanical way, root reserves uh, uh, send up a new sprout and you come back and you kill the uh, plant with a much smaller plant. So you have a lot less um, uh, herbicide use, you have a lot less propane use if you're working with uh, a re-sprouted uh, um, uh, plant there. Uh, in the um, in the uh, the handout that is posted here, there is a this chart that gives you a, a kind of a quick reference uh, guide to the different uh, uh, methods and combinations in terms of uh, relative to each other, whether they're uh, more time consuming or or less time consuming as far as costs. Uh, if you have a volunteer uh, group that wants to get out there and 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 do things, why you can undertake some of these things that uh, might involve more time or more cost, but uh, um, this will um, give you uh, some indication of what's going to be most effective. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I wasn't uh, uh, advising people to, uh, that safety first is a, uh, uh, a thing to remember in all of this kind of thing. Our technician, J.P. Barsky, has coined a, a little um, uh, acronym on the word YES, uh, where Y stands for yourself, where you ask yourself, are you up to the task? Are you well rested, feeling well, properly trained in the use of the equipment, uh, have the proper personal protective equipment? Um, you, you might not want to go out on a day when you've, you know, had an argument with your significant other and take up a, a flamethrower. You know, that might not be a good idea. Uh, is your equipment properly maintained in working order, et cetera? Is it the right tool for the job? And have you checked your surroundings for, up, you know, hazards above, hazards below, hazards, uh, tripping hazards? Are the weather conditions appropriate? Do you have... Uh, um, emergency equipment, and do you have an escape route planned if you need one? So here's a little um, illustration of a place where barberry was controlled. Here's the patch of barberry in this uh, roadside woods. This is on water company property. Uh, I think they went, this is a fall photograph, and they went through and they, they did some control methods. In the same location, the very next spring, um, we didn't have 100% of mortality, but right where that Japanese barberry controlled, here is a patch of spring ephemerals. This happens to be a plant called um, uh, uh, May apple that wasn't there before and um, has taken advantage of the place where the ba Japanese barberry was controlled. So you can see some pretty immediate results. Um, May apple is a is a low hanging fruit taken advantage of by a number of uh, uh, of um, amphibians and, and rodents and small fur-bearing critters and, uh, you know, that will uh, 
that'll feed on it in the early spring. So you can get some uh, some pretty effective results from uh, uh, the control methods, both uh, in, in terms of reducing ticks and reducing uh, um, uh, invasive species, but also uh, seeing the uh, um, uh, the the recovery of some of the native species that you might like to have on the property. And so that's the end of the presentation. Here's contact information if you have any questions. Uh, thank you to all of the people who um, offered up a, a place to uh, uh, to um, do a trial uh, or, or conduct the experimental um, uh, treatment sites and uh, um, we're happy to, to share this information with other folks that might want to, uh, uh, to hear more. So with that, I'll take any other questions. Great. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, and uh, just before we jump into questions, um, as Tom mentioned, there is a handout available. If you go to your GoToWebinar side panel um, under Handouts, there's a PDF um, that includes that reference table that Tom mentioned. So please uh, feel free to check that out and download that before you close out of the session today. Um, so we'll take some time for questions. Just a reminder uh, to find the questions, go to that side panel and um, go ahead and type your questions into the box. We do have a couple of questions already in. Um, so we have a question from Ralph, Tom. Um, going back to the beginning of your talk, you talked about a native barberry species. Do you yes. know the name, the name of that? Uh, I don't know the Latin off the top of my head. It's uh, Berberus something. Um, but it is uh, a native. It's not a, a, a uh, Japanese barberry is Berberus thunbergii, and so it would be some other uh, some other form of that. And I, I, I regret I did not look that up uh, before this. I should have that right off the top of my head, but I don't. I'm sorry. Okay, no, no problem. There are a number of questions around management. Um, there's one from Hayden. Is there an insecticide, a peppermint oil, or neem oil uh, that, for example, that could be added to an herbicide so that you are spraying the barberry plants, but you are also killing the tick population that's present? Um, there, there probably is. Um, what I would direct you to do is um, visit the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment website uh, experiment station website. Um, you can Google uh, C A E S and uh, find them, and uh, they actually have a whole publication on ticks um, and tick diseases, and uh, and they include that type of information about controlling ticks. It wouldn't surprise me if there was uh, uh, one uh, um, insecticide that might be more. Um, effective than others, but it wasn't part of our research efforts, so I wouldn't be able to speak to it uh, uh, in, a, in any kind of knowledgeable way. Okay. Uh, it's an interesting idea, though, isn't it? Uh, it? Another question from John. In areas infested with Japanese barberry, are ticks found mostly on the barberry or mostly nearby? Well, um, both, and it depends on the time of day. Um, there, you know, if it's, uh, if it's, if the if the weather conditions, if the humidity conditions are right for questing behavior, there'll be quite a number of them out on the barberry bushes, you know, just hanging out waiting for an animal to go by. But uh, other times of day, they'll be down in the ground, uh, you know, beneath the, 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 the shrubbery, if you will. Great. The, a question from Peter, I think you got to this a little bit, um, but is spring herbicide treatment as effective as fall treatment? Um, you know, I don't think so. Uh, what little we have, uh, what little data we've gathered in doing both, we've found that uh, if if you can spray during that fall window, or if you can do the uh, the the follow up spray, uh, like if you if you cut the barberry early in this growing season and come back in you know July or August or September and spray the sprouts, it's more effective than if you sprayed them in the springtime. Hmm. Uh, we have another question from Ellen. Uh, if you hand pull entire plants, can you pile the plants on site? Any worries about uh, pulled plants re-sprouting or taking root? You know, there would be a small amount of, um, there, there's a possibility of a small amount of, um, uh, you know, layering type of behavior for a plant that is in direct content contact with the soil and there's adequate moisture and all of that kind of thing. Um, what the what we are more concerned about is timing of that 
acti that type of activity to be done before there's any berries on the plants. Um, you know, so you would want to do that kind of thing earlier in the growing season because uh, it's the it's the berries, the seed, the bank that you might create from something like that. That could be a, a future problem. Um, I suppose there's a there's a very small chance of uh, of new plants, uh, you know, uh, from plants that are in contact with the soil. But um, um, I think it's probably very, you know, conditions would have to be ideal for it. And uh, it's probably a very small uh, risk. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions if you're up for it. Um, we have yep. another question from a, a different John. Uh, do you need to wait two growing seasons after initial cutting to get enough leaf surface area to kill the barberry with a spraying? N no. Um, we've done it the same, the same growing season. You know, you cut it in the early growing season or even in the wintertime. Cut it in the wintertime like these uh, very enthusiastic looking Yukon students that you see here um, <laughs> who are about to engage in this activity. Um, um, cutting it right in the wintertime and then, you know, waiting uh, till midsummer and going back and, and hitting the sprouts with herbicide is very effective. So you don't have to wait till growing season. You, you know, you can go right back that same growing season and do it. Great. A follow-up question. If limited funds, um, if you have limited, limited funds, would you suggest focusing on areas of high concentration or outer fringes uh, of the infestation? Uh, great question. Um, we have um, we have suggested to people the strategy of um, keeping barberry out of places where it's not already fully infested first, okay? If you have limited volunteers or limited funds, like you say, you're probably better off um, dealing with those scattered plants that are around rather than trying to tackle a big infestation. And then when you do do, do tackle a big infestation, um, you can you can do a small area of it at a, at a time. Understand that um, the, the infestations didn't happen overnight. And so, you know, you treat a quarter of an acre of barberry, well, you know, a few little ones might come back into that quarter acre, but it would take a long time for it to become fully uh, occupied again. So it's easier to keep it out than, you know, get it out in the first place. So you tackle small areas at a time. Uh, um, so you feel a, a sense of success and then it's easier to keep them uh, keep them clean. Great. Uh, two last questions for you uh, from Andrew. How about using the flame when snow is on the ground? Um, depends on how much snow and how uh, how exposed to that base of the plant can be. Uh, we've done it and it's worked. Um, and um, but, you know, it, with several plants, we have found that um, flame torching in the in the dormant season doesn't seem to be quite as effective as when the, you know, your, your cambium and your, um, your meristematic tissues are active, you know, that's, that's when flame is really going to have play havoc with a, with a plant. So, um, you know, uh, right at the beginning of the growing season, it might be uh, more effective than during the dormant season. I applied directed flame, for example, to the, the bark of a small um, uh, Elanthus, uh, Tree of Heaven, and for, for a long time, you know, 20, 30 seconds, uh, all the way around the, uh, the, the, I figured I had it effectively girdled. And that tree came out just as nice as it in the, <laughs> in the springtime, just as nice as if I had done nothing, you know, whereas in, this, in the summertime, when doing the same thing, we were able to, to kill it off, so. Hmm. And then um, just one last question following up on that. How about goats? Have you had any experience using goats? Well, you know, uh, I don't directly. Um, I know some people who have tried it and um, we, there's not enough data to, to say how effective it's been as a, um, as a control. There's a lot as a control method. There's a lot more research that needs to be done in this area. Uh, you know, people get some goats and um, they they put them out and, you know, they try their best to, but their focus is on the health of the goats and the, you know, the behavior of the goats and the raising of the goats and the, 
you know, the the fact that the goats are doing invasive control is less important than, you know, uh, raising the goats, if you will. So um, uh, I know goats will eat anything. And I know these people have said it's been pretty good about knocking back the um, uh, the barberry population uh, or the barberry infestation. But um, whether it's an effective entire control method that would allow a native, uh, you know, a, a uh, an array of native plants to return in its place. Uh, uh, that's another story that we don't have enough information on. Huh. Well, great. Well, uh, thanks, Tom. I think that's it for the questions. Um, you've certainly covered a lot of ground this morning, so we, we really appreciate your time and sharing this really interesting uh, research that you've done. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, we're with snow still on the ground. We're not quite thinking about ticks yet, but um, I wanted to mention a couple of resources for folks here in Vermont, um, since we are talking about ticks and Lyme's disease. Uh, the first one is, many of you guys are probably familiar with the Department of Health's campaign, Be Tick Smart. Uh, if you Google that, uh, you'll be taken to the Department of uh, Vermont's Department of Health's website, uh, and they have a page that um, is specifically targeted to, to helping folks think about preventing ticks and and um, and what to do when, if you have a tick. Um, and then also talking about some of the diseases that um, that we're all concerned about. So that's a great resource. I encourage folks to check that out. Again, it's the Vermont Department of Health, Be Tick Smart. Uh, and then the other one is, as many folks know here in Vermont, we're fortunate we have a great website with information about invasives uh, called vtinvasives.org. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out, please take a few minutes and go there. Um, there's all sorts of information on both identification, but also control. Um, so you'll find a page dedicated to Japanese barberry. Um, and uh, so I encourage folks to, to check that out as a, a Vermont resource. Uh, and then finally, too, as, as Tom indicated, uh, there is a handout available um, showcasing some of Tom's work and, and some of the uh, reference material that he uh, spoke about um, as part of the GoTo webinar system. So please, before you sign out today, take a few minutes to, to download that uh, that handout as well. So with that, thanks so much, Tom. I, we really appreciate all your time this morning and, and sharing this important research. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. It was my pleasure. And um, uh, uh, hopefully you won't get the barberry infestations as badly as we have them here, but uh, you never know if you see it, kill it. <laughs> 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 That's a great way, to, great way to end the webinar this morning. Uh, and just a, one final reminder for folks: uh, we do have another webinar scheduled for April twelfth, uh, when we'll be diving back into some of our civil cultural um, topics. We'll be looking at growing red oak in New England. So uh, please feel free to go to the webinar website and uh, and sign up for that webinar and, and learn more about that. So again, thank you again for your for everybody for participating this morning, um, and I uh, hope you enjoy the. Uh, rest of the week. Thanks again, everybody. Bye now. <laughs>